Well, good morning and welcome to our service here at Brunsfield Evangelical Church. My name is Alistair and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our live streamed morning service. You're all very welcome and I hope that you leave the service this morning having been greatly blessed by the time that we'll spend together. This morning we are going to hear from Peter, our youth pastor as usual. We're going to listen to some worship songs and we're going to listen to our pastor Graham as he brings us God's word as we continue through Ephesians and instructions on how we should be living as God's people within our home. We're going to pray and we're going to look at a couple of short videos from some church members about how they've found parenting, homeschooling and working amidst the restrictions. So before we get into our service, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for the time that we are able to spend in your presence this morning as a church family, unified together in our shared faith and dependence on you. Help to soften our hearts and receive your word as we let the Holy Spirit minister to us and guide us as to how we should live and serve you. Amen. Psalm 146 um, sets out that our help from God is lasting and complete. So let's read that to begin our service and then we'll listen to our first song this morning, Living Hope. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose help is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free, gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. There's 
that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the Seal the promise Your very body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Jesus, yours is the victory and I want to speak particularly to the kids. Now, as you can see, we've got some glasses here. We're going to use these to do a little bit of spot the difference. Okay, so first glass, I'm going to put some water in that. And in this next glass, I'm going to put some other water. Water that we found outside. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Anyone? Okay, tell me what that is. What is it at home? It's I a... Think it might be an icicle. It's an icicle. It's an icicle. Right. But it is made of water. 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 Okay. Oh, like frozen water. Frozen water. So here we've got solid water. Here we've got liquid water. Okay. So it's very easy to see the difference there. Okay. Now, all right, I've got something else to show you. Okay. Oh, what have we got here? Two eggs. Two eggs. Okay. Can you tell the spot the difference? Boiled and not boiled. Okay, one is mm. boiled and the other is not. But well, how are we going to be able to tell the difference? Well, spin, there spin is them. there is a little secret to this. Okay, that we can spin them. Oh, that's boiled. That's so that's spinning fast. So that means that's the boiled one. Watch this one. Well, Look at that. So... Not mm. boiled. Okay. Boiled. So, what is it going to be like inside then? What's it going to be like inside in the the raw egg then? The fresh egg, what's it going to be like? Yeah. What's it going to be like? Let's have a look. Liquid. It's going to be liquid. Mm. Okay, so um. in there is liquid. And this one, the one that spins fast, is boiled. And, well, it's solid. In here is solid. Okay, all of that liquid has become solid. So it's a lot like the the water, okay, we've got liquid water and solid water, we've got a, a liquid egg and we've got a solid egg. But there's a big difference between the water and the egg, okay? You see with the water... We can make that back into water and we can make that back. That's right, okay? You can melt the icicle, okay, so it's starting to melt already, it's going to turn back into water. And you can freeze that. And then we could freeze the water and turn it back into ice. 
but there's no way there's no way I can turn this boiled egg back into an egg like this a liquid egg. I, there's nothing I can do it's, I it's, boil it. okay it's solid now there's nothing you can do with it apart from eat it really <laughs> okay I can't make it go back to that and now this links into our story today we're on to sign number Seven. 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 The last one. Sign number seven um, in the book of John. Okay, that's right. That's from our memory verse, isn't it? Jesus performed many signs that aren't written down. That's right. But we're looking at the seven. We've been looking at the seven uh, that John wrote. And this one um, involves a man called Lazarus. Okay, you might know this story. The story of Lazarus. And Lazarus was Jesus' friend. And Lazarus wasn't well. Now, you would think that Jesus would go and help his friend who wasn't well, wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd think he would go. But he didn't. He waited for two days. Um, and he told his disciples that Lazarus was just sleeping. Uh, and the disciples thought, well, okay, if he's sleeping, well, then he'll just wake up again. But Jesus said, no, I need to go. I need to go and wake him up. And the disciples thought, well, that's strange. Why does Jesus need to go and wake him up? If he's just sleeping, then we can just wake up. You see, sleeping, it's a bit like the water. Okay, you can be asleep and awake, asleep and awake, asleep and awake, and you can go back and forth. Every day, hopefully, you'll go to sleep at night and you'll wake up again in the morning. And it's like the water and the ice. Okay, it can change back and forth, back and forward. Okay, it's not like the egg. Okay, when you go to sleep, you can go back. Not like the egg. So the disciples didn't understand why Jesus wanted to go, but then he had to explain. He had to say, look, Lazarus is dead. Okay, he's not asleep. He's not really asleep. He's actually dead. It's like the egg. Okay, because when you're dead, you can't go back. You can't be alive and then dead and alive and then dead, alive and then dead. It doesn't work. It's like the egg. You can't go back. Um, but Jesus went. Jesus went. And uh, he spoke with Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. And when he was speaking to Martha, you know, he asked her, you know, did she believe that Lazarus would um, be alive again? And she said, well, yes, you know, eventually, eventually he'd be alive again, you know, at the, at the end of time. But Jesus said that he was the resurrection and the life. That's what Jesus said. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Okay, and resurrection, that means coming back to life. That's what it means. It means coming back to life. Um, and he wanted to go to the tomb. And not only did he want to go to the tomb, but he actually wanted the tomb to be opened. And everybody else thought, well, that's a terrible idea. Why would that be a bad idea? It would be really smelly. Okay, that's what they said. They said, we can't open the tomb. There'll be a bad smell. He's been in there for four days. Okay, he's been dead and in the tomb for four days. It's going to smell bad. He said, you know, don't you believe what I said? And he prayed to God, the Father, and he thanked God, the Father, that he listens to him. And then he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. He was alive again. You know, for, for Jesus, death was not like the egg, it was like the water. That's why Jesus said it was like Lazarus was sleeping, because for Jesus, being dead or alive is like being asleep or awake. Jesus has that kind of power because he is God. God. He's God, that's right. And many people that saw this, that saw Lazarus now alive again, were amazed and it they believed in Jesus. They trusted in Jesus. But I think we can see where the The Pharisees, is that what you're trying to remember? Yeah, we were talking about that, weren't we? The Pharisees. Other people said to the Pharisees, and did the Pharisees believe? No. No, they didn't believe. They didn't trust in Jesus. They were, you know, they were just angry and annoyed that Jesus had performed another sign. And they just had to then it just made them want to plan even more to get rid of Jesus. They, you know, they saw that this was another sign, another miraculous sign that Jesus had done, 
and that, that people were believing in him and they were worried that everyone was going to believe in Jesus if they, if they let it go on this way. So they kept trying then, really trying to get rid of Jesus. And they, well, they did. In a way, they because they managed to get him killed. But did they manage to stop people believing in Jesus? Mm -hmm. Did they manage to actually get rid of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Why? What happened? Because he came back to life again. That's right. He came back to life again. He was resurrected. He came back to life again. You know, and that's why we can believe in Jesus, because he came back to life. We can trust that what he says is true. Um, but yeah, not everybody believes. Not everyone, you know, trusts in Jesus. Just like those Pharisees, many of them didn't believe in Jesus. Same today. Many people don't believe. But thankfully, lots of people do. Um, but we need to ask God to to open people's eyes so that they can see who Jesus really is. So let's pray about that just now. P R A Y. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for this amazing story of Lazarus and how Jesus brought him back to life. And we thank you that because of that, many people believed in Jesus. Um, and we thank you that even though the Pharisees tried to get rid of Jesus, Lord, that they, they managed to get him killed. Lord, I thank you that he... He rose again, um, like Lazarus, um, and we thank you that, you know, we can trust in Jesus. And I thank you that so many people have been able to put their trust in Jesus and know that they will live forever with you, Lord. And I pray that you would open our eyes, Lord, everyone who's watching, listening, uh, this morning, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would open their eyes to, to see who Jesus really is, Lord. That they would be, they too would be able to trust in Him and know that He is the resurrection and the life, and to know that you know they can have eternal life through Him. I pray this for all the boys and girls and everyone watching. I pray this in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thanks, Peter, for sharing that message with us. Do you know, of all the things that I expected to learn from listening to a children's talk, I'm not sure I expected to learn that it takes, like, a, a boiled egg spins faster than a raw egg. I don't quite know why it's taken me 50 years of my life to learn that, but thank you very much, Peter, for illuminating that fact to me this morning. Every day is a school day. Let me just take a bit of time just to share some of the things that are going on in the life of the church the monthly newsletter that was sent out by Ian this morning, it gives lots of articles to read and I would encourage you to get into that because it gives a real feel for what's happening in the life of the church. But let me just particularly highlight a few things for you and the further details are contained within the newsletter about these and our normal weekly meetings and activities. Uh, our Life Explored course continues uh, over Zoom every Tuesday at 7pm. You can still invite a friend to explore what it means to be truly happy in life. Um, or discover more for yourself. So please contact Alistair if you would like to attend any of those sessions and or bring a friend. Um, please pray for Danny as well and the team as they prepare for the Bible studies for those that are learning English. Uh, they restart on uh, Friday the 19th with the theme, Who Was Jesus? It'd be really great to pray for Danny and the team as they prepare those studies. And please don't forget just our Zoom meeting tonight at six o'clock on Zoom where we'll be continuing in the book of Isaiah and Neil McAllister will speak uh, tonight. So it'd be great if you could come and meet together on Zoom at six o'clock tonight. Now, over the months of restrictions that the coronavirus pandemic has imposed on us, we've all had to face changes to our routines and movements and we've all been affected to one degree or another. And we've spoken a lot at our twice weekly, twice weekly prayer meetings about how tough it's been for people right across the church family. And as we look at our passage today in Ephesians on instructions for Christian household, it seems appropriate to hear from a couple of church members um, about some of the challenges uh, and encouragements that they have found during this time. So we're going to listen to uh, a couple of videos that uh, two of our church members have kindly uh, agreed to record. We're going to watch these videos together and we'll then move into a time of prayer afterwards. Hi, I'm Robert Lansing and I live in Fairmile Head with my wife Catherine 
and her children, Ava who's 10 and Anish who's 6. And over the last year, uh, alongside all the other families, we have, as parents, experienced uh, several challenges. The huge changes that the kids have experienced in terms of schooling and the introduction of homeschooling has brought lots of stress, as I'm sure you can imagine. The, the loss of playtime and the ability to socialise with their friends, uh, the, the loss of contact with family members, it has all been, I think, fairly traumatic for the children and as parents uh, we try to, to protect the children as much as possible uh, but uh, I think stress has, has been the main uh, issue in, as parents over the last year. So homeschooling, I think every parent will agree, uh, is particularly stressful and Catherine has uh, done all, all her homeschooling. Uh, I'm working uh, during the week and I think it's a particular challenge trying to be a parent and a teacher at the same time and so lots of stress uh, there. Uh, We've noticed our children, I'm sure the other parents can relate to this, they become acutely aware of coronavirus and the transmissibility of coronavirus and uh, this is manifest for example in children uh, being reluctant to cuddle grandparents for fear of passing the virus on to them uh, and you know you, you can imagine the stress is involved in that. In terms of positives we have had more time together as a family and uh, we've made a point of for example having family movie nights or family games nights or reading stories together or going on walks together uh, with a dog and uh, that has been uh, a real positive. Uh, in terms of prayer points, uh, we would really be grateful for any prayers uh, round about the, the stresses that I've described and uh, for families who have had a significant financial impact due to COVID uh, and also uh, really for the emotional uh, physical and spiritual well-being of all the, the children uh, who are affected by this at the, the present time. Uh. Hi there. Hi Bransfield. Hi. 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 Um, I'm Ellen. Uh, this is Colin and Stephen. Hello. And Joseph. Uh, we're we're out uh, in the meadows at the moment, and we've been asked to talk to you about. The challenges of parenting uh, during lockdown. And what hard to deal with generally. Yeah. So, um, well, come on. What do you think? I think, uh, <laughs> I think probably uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, we came from an area before we came to Edinburgh that was right in the country. We were very isolated, and we came down to Edinburgh, and we found really a very good, very rich social life, and the kids had. Uh, a lot of activities, Joseph was doing a lot of sports, judo, athletics, football. Stephen found a whole new social life that he was really enjoying. And Ellen and I, we went, we found that Edinburgh had um, a huge amount to offer. You know, theatre, uh, all kinds of social activity. And of course, uh, we found a really great church to get integrated into uh, BEC. And when the lockdown started, really all of that was quite seriously compromised. So, uh, and probably the most challenging part of that was uh, parenting uh, the children. Yeah, I think um, that we went through a bit of a grieving process initially where um, we found it difficult to accept the new situation. Uh, we felt um, really upset um, and quite at times frustrated with one another um, we would um, you know get angry with one another but we kept short accounts we learned to forgive and um, we went into a kind of status quo sort of acceptance of it all um, I think as well um, we felt under pressure to try and um, do what the school does and what all the clubs do and we try to mirror that at home but home's really different it's 
you know, a place where we can relax and uh, retreat and just be ourselves. And it's very difficult to, uh, you know, try and mirror something that's a completely different environment. So in the end, we just relaxed about it all. Um, and we've learned to accept the way each other deals with things. You know, maybe, you know, Stephen, he, he loves the socialising side. So he has found his own way of, of dealing with that. Um, and he goes out with, you know, different um, teenagers, different days every, every, every day. Um, and Joseph, you know, he's got his own way. He, um, you know, speaks to friends from up north uh, through, through games and that kind of thing. They do, they deal with it in their own way. Um, and we have just relaxed about that. So what do you think is is the one thing that you think has been good about it all? Uh, the best thing has definitely been um, uh, the church, specifically uh, for a long time during the lockdown in 2020, the night, uh, the prayer meetings every evening. Um, uh, we've been able to, um, you know, share burdens, uh, share issues but also pray for other people and feel that we're really keeping engaged in doing something for others um, and being involved even though we've been apart through Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, definitely the prayers and when that stopped even uh, making sure that we we're regularly, at regularly attend the prayer meetings uh, a couple of nights a week. Um, the Sunday morning church and the Sunday evening uh, meet uh sort of sermons and prayer time that we've had there most recently all of that's been very very helpful probably actually foundational and crucial and helping us to keep an even keel on the really significant difficulties of the situation guys are you wanting to add anything at all no. yourselves um, anything that you find the hardest bit was probably the homeschooling uh mm. homeschooling yeah, yeah <laughs> don't we love a, it not being amongst his mates and doing his sports has been really difficult yeah and stephen for you yeah, i don't know oh okay. okay so i think we were also asked you know what oh how can you pray for us and we we just love being part of of the church and we just love all the support that we've received and mm -hmm. um, we just asked that, that they would recover quickly when they do eventually go back to school mm -hmm. and go back to their clubs and stuff. Normally children, if they go through a very challenging time, they can take double the length of time uh, to recover. And so we would just pray that they recover really quickly and that they, you know, prosper and go from strength to strength. And we just pray too that, um, that they would, in want to engage again with the church and with um their faith yeah. so god bless you brunsfield god bless. Bye. Bye. bye okay thanks again to robert and to colin and ellen for that very honest appraisal of where they're uh, where they're at just now let's um, let's come before the lord in in prayer father god we come before you this morning with thanks Thanks that we can share this time together, united in our faith and trust in you, Lord, for you are a great God that brings us many blessings. We ask for forgiveness for the times when our behaviours fall short of what you would expect from us. In our thoughts, in our speech, our actions, we often imitate what the world shows us rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to do its work in us, to shape and mould us so that we stand out in the world as followers of you, Lord. Please forgive us. Lord, we pray for our church family here at Brunsfield and we thank you for the many ways in which we work together as a body to seek to grow your church and represent you well. Lord, we've heard today about how difficult our families are finding life just now, trying to balance parenting, working, homeschooling, and it's proving really tough for families just now. But we pray, Lord, that you'll uphold our families and young people and children and be a real source of strength to help them deal with family life as it is just now. But we also pray, Lord, that across our church, others who are going through difficulties, whether through illness, bereavement, work, loneliness, isolation, that they too will know your love and comfort, Lord. We ask that you draw close to them and they would take great comfort from knowing that you are a God who provides for all their needs. 
We just continue to pray for Dorothy Layton following Robert's death. We pray for those who are currently unwell, including those suffering from any mental illness. Lord, we pray too for those who are separated from family members and are concerned about them, particularly those who've got families overseas who face the real prospect of not being able to see them for some time because of all the travel and quarantine restrictions. Father, we just pray too for the ways in which we seek to spread the gospel message. We pray for the Life Explored course this week and the International Bible Study starting soon. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be working in the hearts of those attending so that people will turn their lives towards you. And we pray too for the work of SU and for the work of Ferrywell. We pray, Lord, that you will bless this work as they seek to maintain contact with primary age children and one-to-ones with secondary age young people by going for walks or meeting them over uh, online. Father, we just ask that you'll just be with Graham as he comes to speak to us shortly. And we thank you for all the ways in which you bless us. Amen. We're just going to listen to our next song now. And then after that, we'll have our reading and Graham will come and speak to us.
Our reading this morning um, comes from Ephesians and it'll be from chapter 5, verse 21 through to chapter 6, verse 9. And you can follow the reading behind me. The words will be on the screen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and you is it in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Al, and to everyone who's participated in our service thus far. Folks, great to have you with us this morning. Uh, let me encourage you to have those uh, verses in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 open in front of you. And let me just begin by telling you about a mate uh, that I had in halls at uni. His name is Dave. We call him Army Dave, right? Differentiate him from all the other Daves that were in the halls, right? We called him Army Dave. And you could probably guess from that what the defining feature of Dave's life was, right? He was, he was almost a poster boy of the OTC, right? So the Officers Training Corps, so which is kind of like the, the student branch of the army. Dave is a poster boy of the OTC and Dave loved it, right? Loved it. If I remember being out one day playing football with my mates in the park and seeing 
spotting the OTC in another part of the park doing their thing. Now, I say I spotted them. Before I spotted them, I heard them. Heard them. I remember looking and there was a man in the middle with a whistle, which was strange. But what was even more strange is that these people were doing exactly what he was telling them to do, right? He would, he would say jump and they'd jump. He would say march and they'd march. He would say drop and, what is it, give me 20 and down they'd go. And I remember looking at these guys thinking to myself, woof, that's pretty hardcore, isn't it? Here's the thing. To sign up to follow Jesus, to be his disciple, is to sign up for something way more hardcore than that, right? To, to be a disciple is to, to sign your entire life over to Christ calling the shots, right? And not just over part of your life, all of your life. And not just on, on one day of the week, but every day of the week, all of it, to have Christ call the shots. Now that's true individually, and it's true corporately for the church. And for us as a local church, as, as local believers called to, in our lives together, express and show the lordship of Jesus over every area of our lives. And we're going to see today including those most personal of our relationships, that Jesus is king. Now, if you track back with me in the letter to chapter 1, verse 10, this, this is kind of like the, the, the theme sentence, if you like, that runs over the book of Ephesians. What God is doing in the world, his chapter 1, verse 10, his plan for the future to unite everything in heaven and on earth in Jesus Christ and Jesus as his risen king, the plan is to have everything under his lordship. That, that's the plan for the fullness of time. It's where the future's going. And as the church today, the call for us is to be a community where in our relationships with one another, we submit to Jesus Christ as he rules us through his words. Have Christ call the shots in our community. And so with Army Dave and all his wee hardcore mates in your minds, come with me to verse 21 of chapter 5, right? Which is, which is the headline verse containing the headline verb of this whole little section. You ready for this? Come with me. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now you catch that? What's the verb? Submitting. Right? And sometimes our headings in our Bibles, remember they're not inspired, the word, the word is, those headings are sometimes in the wrong place. This might be one of those examples where the divisions don't help us because that word submitting goes with the section just before. Now the Greek word there means to voluntarily put yourself under the control of another. Right? That's what it means to submit. And do you see how that is the fruit of being filled with the Spirit? Now, do you see how it's, it's the last of the four verbs at verse 18, which Paul pulls out as being the hallmarks of a Spirit-filled community? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Here's number one, addressing singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart is number two, giving thanks, here's number three, and here's number four, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. To, so to submit is to be somebody who is filled with the Spirit. I love that. It's not in ecstatic things, it's in the nitty gritty details of your life. Filled with the Spirit. So to submit to Jesus is to allow him to recalibrate how we think in terms of our relationships with one another, right? So this is what we're going to see today, to have Jesus as, as the Lord of your life, to have him calling the shots. He's going to call you to be a different kind of wife. And he's going to call you to be a different kind of husband. 
and a different kind of young person and a different kind of parent and a different kind of slave and a different kind of master. Now remember, all these relationships are going on in the one church, but most likely all of these relationships might be going on in the one home. And it's as if Jesus, as Paul is getting into picture, he's, Jesus is walking up to the door of your home and he's ringing the doorbell, ding dong, ding dong. And the call is to open the door and let him walk into your family life. Walk into your home. Let Christ call the shots in your lives. Now, let me just deal with Dumbo, okay? Who is the elephant in the room of, of this section, right? Always good to deal with Dumbo. And to acknowledge that this couldn't be any more countercultural, right? You don't need me to tell you that, but we're just dealing with Dumbo. This couldn't be any more countercultural. In our day, this stuff about husbands and wives and family and work, it runs so deeply against the grain of how our society thinks and operates. But here's what the thing that we need to appreciate, that what Paul writes here is equally as countercultural in his day. In fact, I would go so far as to say that this is revolutionary at the time of when he's writing. But we need to appreciate that the cultural pendulum, generally speaking, is on the other side, right? To the one that we maybe find ourselves in today. So this Greco-Roman first century culture where this letter is written, the individuals who were considered lowest down the social ladder, women, children, and slaves. So notice with me who, when he addresses the, these three relationships, notice who he addresses first. Wives, children, and slaves. Do you see it? Do you see it? How countercultural that is. You know, I've got lots of friends who've worked for big companies in their lives, right? Kind of Amazons, your direct line call centers, that kind of thing. And what they always said to me at the time was, you know, when it comes to my work there, just a number. I'm just a number. No one's asking me. No, no one cares if, if I'm there. No, no one's looking at what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just kind of caught up in the collective, right? Nobody cares. I love how Paul addresses wives, children, and slaves as individuals, right? It's almost as if he, if he was here, if he was walking around this church, these churches this is written to, he would, he'd be addressing them by name, right? To you, this is what it says. To you, this is what this says. See what it's saying. But do you see how Paul is, in doing this, he's bestowing on these individuals a real countercultural dignity. And he's massaging home the truth that we saw earlier in this letter, that they are all part of Jesus's one body. And together in the way that they relate to one another, they are called to live in such a way that demonstrates to Ephesus that Jesus is Lord here. So let's get into this, shall we? And first up, friends, we have got a Valentine's Day special. How about this? Look what he says, first of all. He goes for the marriage. See it? Let Christ call the shots in your marriage. Come with me to verse 32. I think this is key for us to see if we're to grasp what he's saying and we don't lapse into moralism, okay? We need to see that as he talks and addresses and thinks about husbands and wives, that Paul has got the ultimate marriage in mind. Okay, the marriage between Christ the groom and the church, his bride. Now, do you see that? It's not our, our marriage is down here. The reality, and that's a useful metaphor to call upon, it is completely the other way around. And this has always been God's created intention. I think that is why he quotes from Genesis 2 there. So this is God's design. This is what it's been all about, about Christ and the church. There's a much bigger game that you're playing in. And so the way husbands and wives the way I'm praying, the way I want you to, to, to live, relate to one another, love one another, you to do it in such a way that spotlights and showcases and reflects the ultimate marriage, the one that's eternal, 
one that's permanent, one that's glorious. And so to the married woman in this church, he says, in the same way that the church submits to Christ, I urge you to reflect that by choosing to submit to your husbands. Now, let me just clarify before we go into what that does mean. Let me just clarify what it doesn't mean. Okay, it's got, my grandpa used to use this phrase, hee-haw, right, meaning nothing. It, it's got hee-haw to do with a wife's inferiority, right? And, and you, the people have horribly abused this over the years. Nothing to do with that. And that's clear if you want an example of this. If you look at the life of Jesus, I love how he is, he's almost the model for both the wife and the husband here. The one fully and equally God, and yet what do we see him doing in John's gospel in the Garden of Gethsemane? What are the words from his mouth? Not my will, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Submits himself to the will of his Father. And equally, it's nothing to do with the husband's superiority, right? And Paul's going to make that crystal clear by what he says next. What this is, is his husbands and wives, both equally and wonderfully made in God's image and called to play their distinctive and complementary parts in showcasing the ultimate marriage. And so Paul says, this is what it does mean, I think, why spring all your gifts and abilities that God has given you to your marriage. And in the same way that the church submits to Christ, I want you to choose to submit to, to affirm and support and encourage and look to and respect the loving and sacrificial leadership of your husbands. You know, I love this. It was Elizabeth Elliot who, I love this quote, right? She said, the fact that I'm a woman does not make me a different kind of Christian. But the fact that I'm a Christian, it does make me a different kind of woman. And Paul's calling Christian husbands to be equally as radical here. Okay, husbands in this time, you read around in this, household codes of the day, husbands would never have expected to be addressed here and certainly wouldn't have been asked, wouldn't have expected to be asked to do what Paul tells them to do. It's probably why they get a bit more airtime in this section because husbands, the command, what he writes is to love your wives. And in this, it's in the same way that Christ sacrificially loved and shed his blood on the cross to win, to redeem, to buy for himself his bride. That's how you're to do it. Wow. Wow. And I take it, if you're a husband listening in today, friends, all of us, we need to feel the beauty and the weight of what he calls us to do. Now, we don't have time to to do justice to kind of every glorious detail and image there. You do that in your own time. But let me just pick out one. Okay, verse 28 and 29. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, flowing into verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it. Now, husbands, think about how you love your own body. Right, I was doing it in the car on the way in today, doing a wee health checklist of how I've got on over the last 24 hours, Right. Good sleep, tick. Hearty breakfast, tick. Hair done, tick. Teeth done, tick. Banana just before I left for that little bit of added energy, tick. Run this week, tick. Tick, 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 tick. Friends, looking after my own body comes very naturally to me and I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Paul says that's how a Christian husband should love his wife. Which means, friends, that you... Husbands, listen to this. We stop what we're doing and we sacrifice time to listen to our wives. We stop what we're doing. We listen well. We stop what we're doing. We go out of our way to encourage her. We go the extra mile to care for her. And we make it our job to lead in such a way that we see her flourish in terms of being the person that God has made her to be. This is a call to sacrifice for the life of your wife. Husbands, love her like you do your own body. You know, I played a little game this week. It's called the Vanity Challenge. Okay, what I tried to do is every minute I spent looking in the mirror, I would try and spend a minute listening to and trying to act this out with Alex. And do you know what, friends? I failed miserably. Here is the call for the Christian husband. 
to love your wife. And you see how, how Paul is saying, husband and wife, as you do this together, you are displaying the ultimate marriage, the ultimate marriage. And it's so important that we've got that ultimate marriage in mind because if we look for satisfaction, whoever we are watching this today, we look for, for satisfaction in a marriage relationship, then we're in for a massive fall. Now, one of the most popular Christmas films of the last 20 years, and some of you love this, it's called Love Actually, right? And, and it contains one of the most cheesy rom-com lines and Hollywood loves it, okay? And, it, and it's when the character played by Andrew Lincoln, some of you will know this scene, he's there, he's standing in the freezing cold, he's pretending to be a, a carol singer, he's at the door, and the character played by Kira Knightley is looking at him, and he's holding up signs, right? And one of the signs he holds up, and this is the scene, and it says, to me, you are perfect. There's the sign. Now, let me just give you five seconds to have a little moment thinking about that and enjoying that. And then let me burst the bubble. Friends, do not buy the lie that any person can complete you. Okay, it's, it's absolute nonsense. You know, for, I'm so conscious that for some of us watching this today, your experience of marriage will have been so painfully the opposite of what Paul outlines here. And maybe you're watching this and maybe you're struggling in your marriage or you're struggling thinking, will I ever be married? And you know what? Perhaps lockdown has just um, brought all those things, all those feelings to light again. But let me encourage us to see, as we think about that scene in Love Actually, that the role of the perfect spouse has already been taken. And newsflash, it ain't me and it ain't you. Friends, we need to look to Jesus Christ. Whoever you are here today, if your trust is in him, would you know that you are in on and will one day be gloriously and fully part of the ultimate marriage and I love this. This is one of the things that, that drew me to Jesus when I read about him in the Gospels for the first time when I was young, that I looked at him, not a romantic relationship in sight, right? It doesn't matter what the Da Vinci Code or the like says, nothing like that going on. And yet here is a man who is living life to the full. Here is a man who is full of joy as he basks in knowing the glory of his father. And it was C.T. Studd who encouraged his wife to say a little poem to herself every day. Dear Lord Jesus, you are to me dearer than Charlie ever could be. You see, friends, let Christ call the shots in your marriage. And let him, and these two other, last two points will be quicker, let him call the shots in your family. Right? Verse 1 of chapter 6, here's Paul's plea to the family. Children, he goes, first of all. Again, think of what we thought of earlier. Children, and I think we're to picture children living at home and following Jesus for themselves. What does he say? He says, obey your parents. And he roots it in the fifth commandment as a way of life that he has orchestrated, which will see them flourish and please us as the Lord. So young people, if you're watching this, know that you can... Worship Jesus. You can honor him simply by the way that you love and you obey your parents. Isn't that amazing? You can do that, whoever you are. And Father's verse four, I take it speaking to the, them, is the one that he wants to take the sacrificial and loving lead in the home. Because if you read around in this one, men in this culture have a habit of being domineering. Paul says, do not provoke your children or discourage them because you put heavy burdens and expectations on them, but rather encourage and love and nurture and instruct and pray for and invest in and get to know your children. And the challenge is, parents watching this today, do we love our children like this? I'll tell you the little challenge in my heart over the last season, and it's to do with the, the comparison game. I, you know, I, I don't know who started these things, but you know how every year, you get those family newsletters through the post or you get them online. Now, I, I love reading all of them, but you read some of them and you think to yourself, that is, it's just a brag about your children, right? You know, the kind of thing. And Julie's doing classics at Cambridge and Mark has been made captain of the football team and, and baby Dave spoke his, 
his uh, first word last month, and that word had 16 syllables in it, you know, that kind of thing. And I find my heart can be so easily dragged away from my primary calling as a, as a Christian parent that all of a sudden my little girl goes to play her first ever goes to her first ever tennis lesson. And in my head, I'm thinking, her first shot, why is she not Serena Williams? Come on. How my heart can get dragged away from something as simple as a photo on, on Facebook. To see the call here, friends, as, as Christian parents that our primary objective, our, our primary desire for our children should be that they come to know Jesus, that they love him, that they know him. And flowing from that, my job as a parent is, is to put all the Jesus-shaped kindling around the fire that I can of their hearts and, and live out in front of them a vibrant love for and need for the Lord Jesus, saying sorry to my children when I've got it wrong and praying that the Holy Spirit would take the kindling around the fire and vomf ignite it. That's our desire for our children. You know, I love um, John Wesley, who famously said about his mum, Susanna. He said about her, looking back on his life, that he, meant, he learned more about Christianity from her than he did from all the theologians in England. Let Christ call the shots in your family. And lastly, let Christ call the shots in your work. So see, in verse 5, he, he speaks to slaves. And you can understand that that's kind of a broad term that's describing, can describe any person who's under the authority of another. And I guess in this culture, it's important for us maybe to discern that this is a different thing from what we'd imagine and we see in scenes like um, 12 Years a Slave or Selma. It's a different thing, okay? You've got a whole economy here built on the kind of master-slave relationship. You have up to, it's estimated, up to two-thirds of a Roman Empire were slaves, and slaves could be well-educated professionals. They could be trained individuals. You bankers are slaves. You've got doctors who are slaves. So though it's not identical, I think we can draw a lot of parallels to our employee-employer relationships that we have today. And look what he writes to slaves and see that this is a heart thing. It's a heart thing. Verse 5, what does he write? He says, obey. Obey your masters. Work well. Be known for your reliability. Be known for your integrity. Be known for your diligence. And his, his wording, gain a good reputation in the eyes of your master. Be working, not just when they are watching, but be working all the time. All the time. And if you do this, you're going to show to the world that you serve a, a greater master, Christ, who has claimed you and changed you knowing that from him you will receive the ultimate inheritance when he comes back. Now, a question to ask at this point, isn't it, is friends, if we think about our, our jobs, what it is we do with our lives, those kind of employee-employer relationships, wherever you have happened to fall in that, do people at work know and do they see it in us that we serve a higher master? You know, I love... Um, I was reading with my kids the other day about Johann Sebastian Bach and how he signed off every bit of music that he wrote with the letters SDG, Sol de Gloria, to God be the glory. That's why he was working, not for pay, not for the plaudits. He was writing, composing for the glory of God. Take that with you this week, SDG, SDG. All right, as you send that email that nobody will see, SDG. Right, as you're in, the, you're in the hospital, SDG, you know, all these things, to God be the glory. Christ has changed how you understand what you do in your work. Right, and to masters, he says, verse 9, he says, remember that Christ is your master too, and you need to treat your slaves well. You know, I love it, back in 2015, the online magazine 24-7 Wall Street it published a list of, of the top 10 companies in America to work for. And the only restaurant that made it in there was Chick-fil-A. Right? Many of you might know that that's a restaurant, restaurant run by evangelical Christians. And they've got a reputation 
for paying well, for, for listening to what their employees are saying, to, to have a bit of flexibility in terms of, of work-life balance. And <clears throat> because of that, people love working there. <clears throat> they love working there. So friends, like Christ called the shots in your work. And how different, friends, this community then that Paul is describing, how different then it's going to look to the watching world. This is a place where Jesus rules. And this is a place where he is transforming our relationships. And the whole goal of our relationships is to glorify him. Just as we close, let me just give you two thoughts that have been in my mind as I've been praying about this this week. Two thoughts for you, and I'll give you two song lyrics as well, okay? Here's thought number one, and song number one. It's a song that I used to listen to a lot when I was growing up. My dad used to love it on the radio, right? And it was called Ooh La La by the Faces. Some of you won't have a clue what I'm talking about. Some of you will love it, okay? But you can Google it afterwards. The chorus went, I wish that I knew what I know now when I was younger, right? I wish I knew, wish that I knew what I know now when I was younger. Here's what I know now, right? Having done the this work thing, marriage thing, parenting thing for a little season of my life now, nothing has revealed my own sinful heart and my need for God's gracious help, quite like marriage, parenthood, and work. Right? And maybe you're, this is, I take it, friends, all of us are going to respond to this like that. Just feeling, wow, as we look at this. And this isn't easy. So the question that you're probably asking is, how do we do this? Now, do you see that the answer here is not to roll up our sleeves, right? That might work for a day or two, but it's certainly not going to last long. And it's not going to last, it's not going to result in transformative change, right? The answer is not roll up our sleeves. The answer is to get on our knees. And remember that this word submitting is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is the fruit of his work. And this is the Spirit given as a good gift to all of God's children. The Spirit who is called the helper. Friends, I take it if we want to see light in our marriages, in our families, in our work, we see the light as we come closer to the flame of Jesus Christ. He's given us the Holy Spirit and he's given us one another to help. And friends, if, you, if you've got questions about anything that's been said this morning or, or anything that you've, you've read, get in touch. It's a community we do this together. We help one another. And it'd be our joy to be able to do that. Here's a second thought then, and with this we close. And I want to take you back to Army Dave. Remember Army Dave and his OTC buddies? The thing that struck me about Army Dave every time I saw him was that he loved the OTC, right? And, and I mean, loved the OTC. And friends, as we see this, as we think about Christ as our master, as we think about submitting and letting his word rule over us, I want, us to, I want to remind us just at the close of the goodness of this and to see the goodness in this but then to see beyond that and see the beauty of the Christ who is our master. And here's the second lyrics, and with this we close. There's joy in serving Jesus. The words of the old hymn, as I journey on my way, joy that fills my heart with praises every hour and every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus. Joy that throbs within my heart every moment, every hour, as I draw upon his power. There is joy, joy, joy that shall never depart. Friends, there is joy in serving Jesus. Let me pray as we close. Oh, Heavenly Father, all of us here will feel the weight of what we've read this morning. We'll see both its glory and its weight. And so, Father, I, I pray for whoever is watching this and whatever is going on in their lives. So many, uh, some of the questions and some of the pains that will be wrapped up in all of this stuff. Father, I pray that your spirit would be at work in each of our hearts 
and in each of our situations, Lord, that you would help us submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that there is none like him. And so, Father, we pray for your help this week as we seek to put this into action. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Graham, for opening up that passage um, to us. We're going to listen to our final song this morning, um, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me.
Thank you so much for being with us this morning and thank you to everyone who has participated in the, the service and in facilitating the live stream. As always, if you have any questions from what you've seen or heard this morning, you can contact us through our website and the contact details are available there. Let me just close with this. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians uh, as an encouragement to his readers and this is in chapter 15, verse 58. And I'll read this as an encouragement to us as a church as well. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Please don't forget to connect uh, to our evening service tonight at six o'clock. Um, thanks again for being with us this morning. Thank you.